call it the shower moment, that moment where one stands in the shower and for the third day in a row say to oneself, I'm just not in the mood to go to work. I don't think I can count the number of clients which over the years have shared the shower moment with me. And frankly speaking, it seems to be a growing trend. So what's the best advice when it happens? Well, that, without any doubt, is... A tricky question, but I think I have the answer, and the answer will come right now. Hey everyone, welcome to all our viewers across the world, our World Business Forum audience, and all our chief executive magazine readers. I'm Martin Lindstrom, your co-host, along with my dear friend, and the world's number one leadership coach, Marshall Goldsmith. Now, Marshall is a member of the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame and has written some of the most iconic books out there, including his latest New York Times bestseller, The Earned Life, Loose Regret, Choose Fulfillment. But beside all that fancy stuff, I had to tell you one thing. He is a remarkable person, and I can only say that we have become better and better friends over the years. So, Marshall, thank you for once again joining us on our MM show. Oh, you know, Martin, I'm so happy to be here with my great friend, Martin Lindstrom. Martin is the world's most interesting human being. So Martin is the world's most interesting person. If you ever get a chance to talk to him about his life, it's fascinating. He's been ranked as Time Magazine, one of the most 50 influential people, but only in the world. 50 most influential people in the world. He's also a member of the Thinkers 50. He's the world's number one expert on branding. And he's written some fantastic books, Biology, Ministry of Common Sense, Small Data, really some interesting and fascinating stuff. And one thing I will say for Martin, he's a good human being. He's done some stuff to help people that didn't have to do and just gone out of his way to be nice to others. So my pleasure to be here. Well, thank you, Marshall. And I just have to say to all of you out there, in case you had never tried to blush, just become a guest on the MM show. It's really <laughs> powerful stuff, I can tell you. Thanks, Marshall. Now, listen, if you have any questions or comments out there, just post them here. Or just tell us 
who you are and where you are. And if you, by the way, like this show, don't forget to press the like, the follow or the subscribe button. Now, Marshall, I think our viewers will love today's guest. Tell me more about Oliver. Well, we have two fantastic guests. Number one, Oliver Berkman. He wrote a book. I knew he was British before I ever met him. The name of the book was called The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. So I love the, I love the title of the book, right? And then also he's got a new book called 4,000 Weeks, and it's making the most of our finite time. He is an award-winning uh, journalist. He works for The Guardian. He's got numerous awards, and he's just written some fantastic and interesting stuff. So very excited to get started. Um, you know, if you don't mind, I'm going to start out by asking you a question about time. I like sure. the title of your book. And one thing you talked about is why week? What does week have to do with anything? I, I just like, um, well, when I first calculated for myself that the average human lifespan in the West is roughly 4,000 weeks, I, I wouldn't say I liked it. I think I had a minor panic attack. Uh, but... <laughs> It really stayed with me um, as a as a way of thinking about time. I think it's just because, you know, it's very easy to feel like you wasted a day. It's very easy to feel like, where did the day go? This happens, I, you know, to people all the time. Yeah. And yet the number of days that you can sort of reasonably expect to live is is so numerous that it sort of feels like it doesn't matter. Yeah. On the other hand, you don't get very many years in a in a ordinary life, but it's really they feel like they're pretty substantial units of time. So it's maybe not so bad. Weeks is kind of the worst of both worlds, right? It's really, it's really easy to sort of wonder where a week went. Yeah. And yet 4,000 is not a very large number uh, in the scheme of things. So I was, I was sort of using that as the title of the book and I'm, and I'm sort of fascinated by that, by expressing it in those way, that way, just because it's sort of, you know, it's startling. Now I hope that actually what I have to say about that is not, actually stress inducing i think it's the opposite of stress inducing but it's it, it's attention grabbing i suppose always oh, it's, it's funny because i i remember i read that article as well in the new york times and i pulled it out and showed it to my friends and started to sort of calculate that some of my friends will only see five boxes for the rest of my life mm. because i really was seeing them and it really created a shock on on me and my friends to pull ourselves together and change our act how do we opt out of this rat race? Well, that's the, that's the big question. I think that, I guess to answer it at a quite a sort of abstract level, I'm happy to get more specific, but my argument, I suppose, is that um, we, we, we invest a lot of energy in tr trying to sort of deny the truth of our of our finite nature trying to not feel what it means to mm -hmm. to be finite with all the ramifications that that has like the fact that you know we're going to have to decide not to do the vast majority of the things we could in theory do uh we're going to have to really be willing to let go of a lot of possibilities in order to focus meaningfully on a, on a small handful of them. And people would much rather feel that sometime in the future they were going to become superhuman, you know? So they're just on, they're sort of en route to this fictional time when actually they're not finite uh, anymore. And so really, I think that the, the path to a, a different way of being here is almost a kind of defeat. It almost starts with a kind of defeat where you have to say like, okay, like, I'm never going to escape the human condition. And once you stop trying to do that, once you recognize that there will always be too much to do, that there will always be more exciting things you could in principle do than you will ever get to do, it's actually a huge weight, or I found it to be a huge sort of burden off your shoulders because now you don't need to worry about this kind of mythical state of being on top of everything. And you can really focus on the few things that, that really matter to you. Does that make yeah. sense? A, a ton. Now, I don't know if you would define yourself this way, but I'm a Buddhist. Now, I'm not a religious Buddhist. I'm a philosophical Buddhist. And to me, you've done a fantastic job of articulating some of the most important concepts of Buddhism. Uh, Buddha was brought up very rich and lived in a palace. He was able to sneak outside three times. What did he learn? First, you get old. Two, you get sick. Three, you die. In other words, shit happens. <laughs> 
<laughs> as you mentioned, that is that's it. That's and you can have all the money in the world and it doesn't happen. And you never get to everything's gonna be okay when when I right. get to this place, right? There's only one book that ends with and they lived happily ever after, which is called a fairy tale. So right. that's that's not the real world. Now you gave me we talked earlier, you had some good thoughts about living in the present and children even. Any reflections on that you'd like to share? Yeah, I th this is a meaningful topic to me just because I think that, you know, it's a cliche that you should live more in the moment, live more in the present. And and I try to sort of get at it by a hopefully a more a slightly less cliche route. I mean, what I'm, I think that one of the effects of focusing too hard on trying to make the very most of our time, trying to fit everything in, trying to extract as much value as we possibly can from every moment is actually, as you've hinted in what you just said, that we sort of end up living perpetually in the future, right? right. Because it's like the whole notion of making the best use of time has this sort of built in future aspect, which is like, well, making the best use of it for what um, doesn't necessarily have to be for making vast amounts of money it could be for anything it could be for some very sort of down-to-earth goals but it's all still putting the meaning of life in the future and right. um and i think that people can get uh, myself absolutely as well earlier on in my life you know you can get completely caught up in this you can be doing very good very meaningful things i'm not talking about being sort of a a sort of vulgar materialist or anything but you can be you can be doing all these things and subconsciously putting all the purpose of them in some some moment of truth that's going to come in the future when you have it all together or when you finally launch this or get married or have right. kids or when the kids leave home whatever it is and you always just nominate you know a new a new thing in the future to to postpone things un until so i yeah i guess what i'm what i'm primarily trying to say is just that you know we we always are only in the present moment anyway um worries about the future regrets about the past they take place in the present moment and so it's really just a question of you know falling back down to earth with a bit of a with a bit of a bump and and seeing that um uh you can only ever decide to do the next the next right thing you know to quote either carl jung or anna from frozen um <laughs> that it's only ever a question of making a decision about the next moment, which again, I think is a huge weight off my shoulders, right? You don't have to take control of your whole life. You have to take control to the extent you can of, of the next moment and the next and the next. Okay. Well, fascinating stuff. I have to say now coming up, listen to this. This is crazy. She quit her job as a high powered uh, executive, actually as a lawyer, and then she turned into a New York Times bestselling author. This is a fairy tale story, I guess, but it's actually real at the same time. So stay tuned and learn how our next guest managed to do what she really loved to. I guess with that, it leads me to the introduction of Suzanne Kane, which is a former corporate lawyer. Now in 2015, uh, she announced her launch of her mini mission-based organization, Quiet Revolution, that aims to change the lives of introverts by empowering them with information tools and resources they need to survive and thrive. Now, Suzanne is the author of two New York Times bestselling books with Quiet hitting the number one spot and Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Makes Us Whole, Changing the Way We Think. Welcome, Suzanne, to our show. Oh, we have a sound problem here. On no, this we don't. We don't. We don't. Um, oh. Hello. Thank you so much. It is great to be here with all of you. It's a pleasure. Listen, we've spent a lot of time studying things, but one of the topics you've studied, which is so unusual, but so relevant, is the idea of introverts. Mm -hmm. What did you discover? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, so much. I mean, well, first of all, I discovered that the premise of of the book that I wrote about it, Quiet, like is really true because I kept hearing about it once the book came out from thousands and thousands of people that um you know that that so many people feel that there is a mismatch between their way of being and their own preference of how they want to spend their time 
and um, the way in which they feel they're supposed to spend that time. And that that leads to a colossal waste of talent and energy and happiness. Another thing that I discovered is that so many people are walking around feeling this way. And it's often people who you wouldn't expect. And I discovered this, you know, right after my book came out, I gave this TED talk about it, about, about quiet and introversion. And I came off the stage and I found myself suddenly surrounded by all these CEOs and sort of master of the universe types who frequent the TED conference, um, all coming up to tell me that they too are sort of secret introverts and nobody knows this about them. Um, because they're all kind of like presenting a very extroverted face to the world. But over these years, I've become <laughs> the world's confessor of, of these types. And I hear about these stories. So if you're out there listening and you think this is you, I will tell you, you're very much not alone. You know, I want to have a question for actually both of you, because one of the most absurd books ever written in history is called The Secret. Now, if you haven't read The Secret, it's so last time I checked, seven million copies, right? A complete nonsense book, The Secret. And the essence of The Secret is if I envision it, it will happen. Now, you mentioned both of you have talked about kind of the fallacy of just positive thinking. And what they did in The Secret is, for example, Jim envisioned being a basketball champion, and he was. And Mary envisioned cancer would go away, and it did. And uh, Jane wanted to be a movie star, and she envisioned it did. Of course, they didn't interview the million dead people who envisioned the cancer would go away. They didn't interview the thousand waitresses in Hollywood who envisioned movie stars. And they didn't interview any of the players that lost. All they did is talk to the winners. It's, it's you know, basically, he did this. He is successful. Therefore, if you do this, you will be, which is all complete nonsense. So both of you, I think, are two of the few authors who've actually dealt with this. And kind of said, you don't have to go through life pretending all the time. So I hope what I'm saying is making some sense to you. I'd like to get both of your thoughts on this. Uh, Susan, you go first. Well, um, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question. I, I, I don't believe as the secret says, and I haven't read the book, but you know, the idea that whatever you think it, it's, it's going to automatically uh, manifest. But I, I do think at the same time, I, I just came across the other day, um, this quote by the three, three poet, minutes, if you do, by the poet, Mary Oliver. Um, and I don't remember the exact words of it, but she was basically saying, um, the, the people who feel the most intense regrets at the end of their lives are the ones who had some kind of creative impulse or creative drive that they never saw through. Yes. And, and I do think that that is, um, th those are words worth heeding. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you have the idea early in life that you're going to be a great concert pianist or whatever it is, and you're necessarily going to see yourself at Carnegie Hall one day. But I do think that there are always ways to manifest the the creative impulses or, or just the impulses that we have to be generative and productive, and that it, it actually is crucial to follow those through. And there's always a way of doing that. Um, so maybe it's like a more realistic version of what The Secret was talking about. Oh, what's your thought? Well, I was just struck by you were talking about the sort of the selection bias side of this, which has always intrigued me. I wrote in an earlier book about how, you know, you hear this idea that we should be willing to embrace failure because it's crucial on the road to success. And I think there's a lot of truth in that, but but you very rarely, you only ever hear it from people who've gone on to turn that failure into yes, immense so success. You, you, you don't hear from the people who just failed. Um, and I wonder if there's a, I mean, one of the things that strikes me about uh, Susan was writing about in her earlier book is that there's this, you know, we also, I think, live in a world of selection bias when it comes to the way that, uh, that extroverts, I don't quite understand where I fall on that scale. I, I feel like I'm changing all the time, but, but the, the, you know, history is written by the extroverts in a certain sense. There's another kind of, um, if you're, if you're naturally quiet, then you're less likely to have sort of um, made the pronouncements that we use to decide how things really work. And actually, you could be doing as that as you showed in that book, you know, uh, some of the most important work and some of the most uh, interesting things. But again, it's just that sort of like, well, of course, people who are shouting about stuff all the time are going to be the ones who you hear shouting about stuff all the time. I think this I... this phenomenon just kind of 
repeats itself through all aspects of human life. I mean, it's just, it's just, yeah, we, we have a very distorted view of things because of, because of who we hear from the most. I, I, I guess I, I would respectfully disagree with one point that you just made, which is the idea of history being written by the extroverts. Um, because one of the, the reasons that I wrote Quiet was out, out of the observation that introverts contribute to the world in so many different ways. Um, most writers, I, I would say, if we're talking about who's writing the history. Um, yeah, right. Writers, literally speaking. Yes, are exactly. literally yeah. like, it, they tend to be introverts or they're at least sort of ambiverts who have a kind of introverted streak to them. And, and I think that these are people who are contributing because of their quiet way of being and not in spite of it. And yeah, I, 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 I think it's partly it's just a bad metaphor. I, I, I certainly don't mean that history is made by the extroverts, but just that, you know, there's a you can get a very distorted sense of who's most important if you listen to the people making the most noise, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So here we go. All of you are watching Brits against uh, Americans happening right Not now. Enough. That's super interesting. <laughs> like, just teasing. Susan, I had to ask you a question here because introverts and the concept of teams and zoom cultures where if there's just five seconds of silence the first comment you receive is you are mute and mm -hmm. introverts i presume mm -hmm. are reflecting and thinking and pausing which is part of their tools of conveying and collecting their thoughts how do you develop a workplace which at all is catering for this type of personas this is probably the biggest question that I hear from one company after another, after another. It, it, it's a perennial problem. Um, there was a statistic that came out of the Kellogg School uh, some years ago that in your typical large meeting, you have three people doing 70% of the talking, right. which is such a huge problem, not just for the introverts, but everybody who just depends on having good ideas out there and not having bad ideas um, necessarily uh, dominate. So. So what do we do about it? Um, there's a number of techniques that people can use to really turn this around. And one is just the simple practice of the person running the meeting, kind of noticing who is talking and maybe just going around the room so that everybody has an, or around the Zoom call so that everybody has is equally invited to speak. Um, I also love the, the, the system of brain writing where if you have a problem that you're collectively contemplating, um, everybody writes down their idea, whether in a post-it, if you're in person or, or on the Zoom. Um, and then the facilitator takes all those ideas and then you contemplate them. And so now you've just like bypassed the whole jockeying for position based mm -hmm. on who is more comfortable <clears throat> talking first. Um, but, but there are also things that introverts can do. And one really simple practice is to, if you know, if you know that you're somebody who has a lot to offer, but you tend to be more reserved, you can have a kind of quota system with yourself where you decide, okay, on this Zoom call, I'm going to speak twice. And you might prepare in advance what you're going to say and just make sure that you do it, even if it's not super comfortable for you. And then you're making that deal with yourself. So once you've met your quota, now you can kind of, um, be a little quieter and not feel guilty about it. And you do that and little by little by little, you actually become more comfortable. And so you don't even need uh, the, the scaffolding of the quota system uh, later on. Thank you for your advice. I, I know I think a lot of us will, will find that beneficial. Okay, coming up, she quit her job and began her career as a writer with just one day's warning. Will she, and that's to say, and recommend everyone else to do the same? I think the answer will surprise you. And I have to ask you straight away now, Suzanne, with that question, would you recommend other people to do it? Is it really worth it? Oh, there's so much to say about this. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I have to say in all honesty, and I, and I think it's important for other people who are thinking about this, I had a gigantic, you know, you could call it a kick in the pants, let's say, because I was a corporate lawyer, I was on partner track. And there came a day when a senior partner partner in my firm came to me and said, we're not putting you up for partner. And I didn't really know, did that mean this year or ever? But 
and, and I experienced it at the time as a terrible failure, you know, to Oliver's point, it, it really was one of those <laughs> catastrophic moments. Um, but it was also a get out of jail free card for me. And I left the firm like three hours later. And I expected that I was going to kind of go around the world and travel and just, you know, take it easy for a while. But what I found was that I started writing, which is what I'd wanted to do since I was four years old. Um, but here's the key thing to answer your question. Even once I started writing, I never in a million years thought I was ever going to be able to make a living at it. And so I started like a little freelance business teaching negotiation skills just so I could pay my rent um, and, and, and was just writing as my beloved hobby kind of on the side. And I believe that is actually the key to creativity, like that there's, we have this narrative that we like, especially in the US, that, you know, if you have your dream, you should chase the dream, you should take the big risk, you know, don't worry about if, if it doesn't work, if you care enough about your dream, you're going to take those risks. And I think that's a disaster for creative work. I think we're much better off creatively when we're not worrying about paying the rent, when we have a solid plan B in place, and you can just go and enjoy the, the creativity itself. It's, and it's much more likely to actually pay off in the end. Well, I tell you, the comment you gave right now will fit a lot of people out there. And it actually leads me to the BCG Minute, which, Marshall, can you just introduce today's BCG Minute contributor? Yes, our contributor today is a wonderful friend of mine, a person who's dramatically influenced my life, Dr. Jim Kim, fairly quickly <laughs> as a simultaneous MD and PhD in anthropology from Harvard. Uh, if you know anything about getting a PhD in anthropology and an MD at the same time, not so easy. <laughs> He's an incredibly brilliant guy. I'm so proud of him. He led Partners in Health and his work and the work of Paul Farmer, just another great person, literally saved tens of millions of lives. So just, I love Dr. Jim. He then went over to Dartmouth where I met him, was president of Dartmouth College. And then after he left Dartmouth, he became president of the World Bank. He was there for seven years. Now he's Global Investment Partners. And he's just an A plus wonderful human being. And, you know, I'm just going to go back to a comment that Susan made. He's a role model of how to do this. And anyway, tell us about the question. And I want to get people's responses. Well, let's run the BCD minutes. I'm very happy to be able to uh, ask a question. I'm a huge fan of the Eminem show and of both Martin and Marshall. Uh, so for the, for the guests, uh, I have really two questions. Uh, I myself have re reinvented my career uh, at last count about seven times. My question for you is, how did you know it was the right time to move? And then when you knew it, how did you find the courage to make that jump? What a fantastic question. I mean, Oliver, what's your view about this? Wow. It, yeah, I'm just thinking about where and when this is applied in my in my own life, because I'm sure this is the case for many people. When I look back at the career changes that I've made and the decisions that I've taken, it's always been in the, for me, you know, in my case, it's always been in the service of getting to do the kind of writing that I want to do. I've been, had a very sort of one track mind in that, in that respect. So I've sometimes sort of walked away from things that seemed like great opportunities or stopped doing things that 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 uh, might have made sense to carry on doing to other people just because of that navigational principle. But it never felt like that in the in the moment. Um, I was really influenced. I have been really influenced by the work of a of a Jungian psychotherapist called James Hollis, um, whose all of whose writing is marvelous. But but one of the things that he suggests is as a, as a way of sort of asking about yourself about choices and life paths like this is to is to ask yourself whether the path that you're contemplating or the path that you're currently on is one that enlarges you or diminishes you. Mm. Um, as kind of a form of words, it's as an alternative, you know, to asking, will this make me happy? Because as we all know, this is a disastrous question that we're all terrible at answering as, as human beings. You know, we get it wrong all the time, predicting what will make us happy. Um, and I have just had that feeling at certain moments in my career, I suppose, that, um, 
you know, something might be comfortable, it might be fun in a way, it might be paying the bills, but it was no longer a way to grow. And on the flip side of that, something can be kind of unpleasant in certain ways, difficult and not and not enjoyable in the moment, but you can still be fairly confident that um, it, it is a path of enlargement. Um, the most obvious thing, Rishi, I'll just finish quickly, but like when I stopped writing the Guardian column that I'd been writing for well over a decade, um, it was mainly because I was aware that, you know, I would love to get the next thing lined up first and not stop doing this until I could make a nice little transition to the to the next perch. But it became very obvious to me, and it's always been obvious to me in other contexts too, that it just never happens that way, that I would have to actually create some stakes and, you know, um, stop doing one thing in order that the next thing would would happen and and take shape so that's 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 the other thing that's meant a lot to me is just like yeah i i i feel like i'd love to just make these transitions smoothly but i never seem to do that for some reason <laughs> this is exactly what you did susan right you you didn't have your plan b running there how, how did you get the courage well i mean i had one moment um I was about halfway through my time as a corporate lawyer, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when my grandfather died and, and I had been very close with him mm. and he died at the age of 94 and he had been a rabbi all his life and he was still practicing as a rabbi up until a week or two before he died. He was still mm. like going to the synagogue in his wheelchair and giving sermons to you know, to a full synagogue and spending his weeks thinking about what the sermons were going to be like all the way up until the end. And I remember having, it was one of those epiphany moments, you know, where I thought, gosh, would I want to be practicing as a corporate lawyer when I'm 94 and very close to my deathbed? And I realized, no, like, I don't even want to be doing it now when I'm you know, in my late twenties, um, which is what I was at the time I had this thought. And it took me a while to act on that thought, but it really was one of those, you know, lamppost light bulb moments for me. Um, and I don't think, I, I think I've been just so incredibly like strike of lightning lucky that the thing I love doing most happened to work out as a career. I don't think it necessarily needs to. I just think it's important that whatever the, you know, the real light is inside you you find some way to manifest it, whether it's through your day job or not. Marshall, yeah. what's your thinking here? I, I love what both uh, both people just said. You know, it's a very, really great thought. And give me some help here. I, I coach people all the time. And that's what I do for a living. And I used to do pretty much just coaching for behavioral change. But now I work with a lot of people. They're already billionaires anyway. So, you know, what am I supposed to do? Get them from 4 billion to 4.1? You know, who cares? <laughs> so now I spend a lot of time coaching people about their lives. And I think both of you really hit on something that's key, comfort. I think one of the greatest challenges we have in life is comfort. And when we're really comfortable, it's hard to change. If I look back on my life, the best coaching I ever got, things were not going poorly. I was doing very well. And my friend, Dr. Paul Hersey told me, he said, you're making too much money. Your customers are happy. You're too comfortable. You will never be who you could be. And he was exactly right. It took me a while to get over that, but he was right. Just a quick thought. You can coach me now. You're coaching somebody who's basically got a house, maybe in a job and they're doing well and they're comfortable they're not being who they could be. Uh, what advice do you have basically in your own life or just in general for this person? Imagine I'm this person. What advice do you have for me? Who do you want um, to go first? Sure. You talk to Susan still. You're still talking to Susan. I'm sorry. Carry on. Oh, um, I'm a big believer in general, not even just for this question alone, in the power of small wins. And so I would say for this person, like once you've identified what the thing is that's missing, um, you know, spend 10 minutes a day at it. Like no matter how busy we are, we can find 10 minutes and maybe from there, 15 minutes and then 20 minutes um, and, and just see where it takes you. And again, to, to do the thing that you love best without any of the pressure of feeling like it will only have been a success if I end up 
you know, doing this on some kind of a world-class stage, forget all that. You're just doing it for its own sake and you're carving out 10 minutes a day. Thank you. I love that advice. Now, tough act to follow. <laughs> now it's your turn, Oliver. <laughs> right. Following that advice and coaching you, all of this is, uh, is a recipe for uh, triggering my <laughs> imposter syndrome to the maximum. Um, I just want to say one thing that I suppose it maybe pushes back a little bit, both against something I was saying and, and what you were saying, Marshall, but that is just that it's been very helpful for me at transition moments to remember sometimes that the stakes are not as high as I'm liable to think that they are in my subconscious. You know, um, obviously people have different levels of privilege and good fortune, but, and I don't come from a particularly sort of astoundingly privileged background or anything, but I, I have always, you know, I've, I don't think I've really ever been in a situation where if I'd made a wrong decision with what I was doing, I was going to be sort of literally living on the streets. Mm -hmm. And yet the sort of, um, the kind of anxiety that can build up about making a big decision often does have um, those kind of catastrophic fantasies involved. So I say this not really just to berate anyone watching that they are better off than they think they are or something like that, and not to um, uh, not to deny that there are some people who, who do face more catastrophic consequences, but just to sort of, I think that we have a natural tendency whatever could be the results of it all going wrong, we have the, a, a natural tendency to sort of add another 10 to 20% to those, to the, or more to those thoughts. And I have found it very useful to go through that process of asking what, what's really the worst that is remotely likely to, to, to happen here. And, and it can make changes. It's not so much finding the courage to make changes, but actually reducing the amount of courage required. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. All, all, it, it, it reminds me about another person said to me that nine out of 10 of all your concerns have been proven to be irrelevant or non-existing, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, you know, I, I love that stuff. And I, I want to say thank you to both of you because amazing. And I'm sure that you will help a lot of people out there. Just want to hand over the baton to, to, to you, Marshall. What are you taking away here? Yeah, I'm going to share a personal story. I just taught at the Indian Institute of Technology. Now, to put this in context, I went to UCLA where I got a PhD. They had 165,000 applicants last year. Indian Institute of Technology had 10 to 20 times that many. It's the most difficult school to get into the world. We were talking about life. And I want to share two thoughts, one from Oliver and one from Susan. I was talking about life and aspiration and why am I here and why am I doing this? And Susan, some of these kids were clearly going through what you were going through. I thought they might be bored, disinterested. Who's this crazy, touchy-feely old man talking, right? Ten of them started crying. Wow. Just started crying while I was speaking. They had been so driven their entire lives to get yeah. into the damn Indian Institute of Technology that their life used to be like this and they thought they could relax. Now it's like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like two thoughts I got from both of you. One is from Susan, you don't have to spend your whole life doing this stuff you're dreaming about, but do some of it. You can still graduate from the damn school, but that doesn't mean you can't do some of it every day, which I love that. Thought. I, I wish I'd talked to you before I talked to them. I'd give them a little bit better advice. And, <laughs> and, you know, and Oliver, I like your advice, too. What's the worst that's going to happen? You graduate from the damn Indian Institute of Technology, you're going to starve to death. <laughs> I mean, yeah, what, yeah, they can change their career, right? You've got an IQ of 12 million. You can change your career anyway. You're not going to starve. It's okay, kid. You're going to do just fine. So I just want to say thanks to both of you. I thought both of you, I, I wish I'd talked to them both. I wish I'd talked to you both before I had this talk. But I think it's great advice to give people at all stages of life. So thank you. Well, I'll last say thank you as well. All the way, I love your input where you talk about let's get rid of that burden we all have where we want to have more, we want to be better. It's fine to some extent, but at some point, as you're saying, if you can get rid of that and come to realization of what reality really says, then it's like you're lifting a huge burden off your shoulder. So, Sen, yeah. I, loved, I love your uh, thought about... Uh, having small wins, quick wins, which are breaking down these daunting challenges you have in front of you. So maybe you can't do all of it in one day, but just take a bite of it and make it happen. 
So thank you to both of you. And I just want to say that Suzanne was so kind to offer a discount to all of you which are watching uh, on her education training program. Now you can find out where that is if you check out our address here. So check out martinlindstrom.com slash mm slash for show notes and hundreds of free videos from our many shows and of course, free tools and books. And we have more than 400 videos out there, which is crazy, which is sound bites from the all of us and the sense of the world. So just check out the QR code right now and you will be able to get the discount. Plus of course, see a lot of goodies from the past. So thanks to all our guests. And by the way, next time we meet up, it's the 22nd of November where we'll have Tom Peters and ah. this vice man on our show. Now, Tom Peters is the author of in Search of Excellence is the book which changed the way the world does business and is often tagged as the best business book ever written. Now, Tom received, I think, his 50 Lifetime Achievement Award, and you'll be joined by Liz Weissman. She's the author of New York Times bestselling Multiplies, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter. She's also an advisor to Apple, to Disney, to Facebook, to Google, to Microsoft, and I don't know who else but a lot of other things. And of course, he's a member of the Thinkers 50 list. These are the guests. Thanks to the guests. Thanks, Marshall, as always. And we'll be back again the 22nd of November. Bye for now. Bye -bye. <laughs>